Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. This is Colibri's weekly column. May 27th, 2020. What is a native plant in a changing world? The term native plant has become a common one, and many people probably assume that the definition is clear-cut. However, like many other seemingly simple designations, that's not actually the case. Whether a given plant is considered native where it is found growing is dependent on the interpretation of the interrelation of three factors, time, place, and human involvement. So, in the United States, a plant is generally considered native only if it grew here before European colonization. On the East Coast, that's the 1500s, and in California, that's 1769. Plants introduced since then, whether deliberately or by accident, are labeled non-native, introduced, exotic, or in some cases, invasive. In the UK, some would set the date for 8,000 years ago, when rising sea levels made those land masses islands. The Checkered History of Nativeness The UK was where the concept of nativeness was first proposed, in the mid-19th century, by Hewitt Coltrell Wallace. Wallace also included naturalized species, which were species that humans had introduced, but which had come to live without them unaided. The correlation of native equals good and non-native equals bad was first popularized by, I'm sorry to say, the Nazis. In reference to an introduced Asian plant species, Impatience parviflora, a team of biologists in the Third Reich wrote, As with the fight against Bolshevism, in which our entire Occidental culture is at stake, so with the fight against this Mongolian invader, in which the beauty of our home forest is at stake. Oh, brother. A U.S. American took up the cause next. In 1958, a man named Charles Elton published a book entitled The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants, which was not so much a scientific treatise as a polemic laden with war jargon. He set a bellicose tone against invasives that is still with us today. In the late 1990s, the National Invasive Species Council was promulgated by an executive order of Bill Clinton, with Monsanto and other chemical giants among the parties who helped write it, in order to encourage the use of herbicides they manufacture. State and local governments took their lead from this council, quickly spreading its viewpoints and methodologies nationwide. Plants on the Move Returning to the world of empirical science, we know that, historically, plant ranges have always been in flux, often in response to climatic shifts. Fossils and phylogenetics are two things that can show us where plants used to live and where they come from. Such information, though, raises questions even as it illuminates. For example, when Spanish colonists arrived in California in the 18th century, coast redwoods, known botanically as Sequoia sempervirens, grew in a strip nearly 500 miles long and 5 to 47 miles wide from what is now Monterey County in the south to Curry County, Oregon, in the north. But only 10,000 years ago, they grew as far south as Los Angeles. And 5 million years ago, they were found in Europe and in Asia. Today, after over 95% of the coast redwoods in California were heartlessly cut, the species has been spread around the world by humans, including to New Zealand, where a 15-acre grove has been growing for over a century. Due to favorable differences in soil and rainfall there, the trees happen to grow faster there than on the U.S. West Coast. The grievous sin of destroying so many redwoods in California is compounded by the fact that much of their former habitat is now so altered by factors such as erosion from logging that it won't be a home to these grand trees again for the foreseeable future. We can ask, then, whether such degraded places still comprise part of the current native range of the species or not. Further, we could also ask why that range does not include places like the grove in New Zealand where the tree is thriving or whether a redwood grown in a European location within its historic range 5 million years ago is truly exotic, or if it's just coming home. For many, the issue is human interference as opposed to natural dispersal. In this way of thinking, the creosote bush, Laria tridentata, an emblematic plant of the U.S. southwest Mojave Desert, is native even though it's from South America because its means of conveyance over those many thousands of miles was non-human, possibly in the tail feathers of migrating plovers. 
But this way of thinking also tends to ignore an important element, the influence of indigenous humans over history, which definitely impacted the native ranges of many plants and animals. Indigenous Land Management Practices Controlled burns by Indians on the Great Plains expanded prairies at the expense of forests, which led to the spread of the buffalo. Similar techniques on the West Coast maintained oak savanna and suppressed the growth of firs and hemlocks. Seeds, bulbs, corms, and other plant material for propagation were collected, transplanted, and traded far and wide among tribes in North America. Some species, such as certain mariposa lilies and the genus Calichortus, may have dwindled in number to the point of being endangered these days in part because they are no longer actively harvested and tended by humans. The case of the California fan palm is particularly intriguing. For years, it was believed that the iconic species was a millions of years old relict, left over from when its current desert home in Southern California was much moister. However, phylogenetic analysis proved that the species emerged quite recently, since the last glaciation period 11,000 years ago. It's long been known that Indians made use of fan palms and their groves for food, craft material, and as places to live. They planted trees, and they also set fire to them to clear away the dead fronds so that it would be easier to climb to collect the dates. Fan palms are naturally fire tolerant. However, it also appears that they might have been responsible for introducing them to the majority of their natural range beyond the small area in Baja California where they originated. See my essay, Did Native Americans Introduce Fan Palms to California? If this is the case, then the groves that remain are not the results of natural dispersal, as that term is usually understood, and are more akin to abandoned agricultural sites than to wilderness. What, then, is the best way to treat them? I mean, if we're not going to allow tribes to maintain and use them as they did, which is obviously the right answer. Burning is prohibited these days, as is harvesting and planting the fruits when the trees are on public land. Our current policy aims to protect, which is understandable, but perhaps the actual result is neglect. California fan palms are not the only trees that humans have moved around. In Asia, the native range of the Carpathian walnut coincides with the route of the Silk Road. In eastern North America, the ranges of black walnut, pawpaw, persimmon, chestnut, and shellbark hickory also seem to be the result of indigenous human influence. So what we consider to be natural or wild is in many instances human-made or human-impacted. Some would go so far as to say that the very concept of wilderness is tantamount to indigenous erasure. That settler colonialists, mostly of European descent, have wreaked havoc on the ecosystems of America is all too clear. To conclude from this that all the introduced plants who live here now, quote, don't belong, is a step too far, in my opinion, and the idea that they should be eradicated is not merely misguided, but dangerous. Fortunately, the conversation does not need to be so limited. Novel Ecosystems and Ecological Succession Often, native plants are valorized and non-natives villainized in a reflexive manner that belies the facts on the ground. How well an introduced plant has integrated into its new setting is rarely considered, or the question of whether plants can become native. In California, one-third of native butterfly species now use non-native plants as food sources and as egg-laying sites. The range of some of these butterflies has expanded as a result. This has been fortunate for the butterflies, since so much of the habitat that previously provided for them has been destroyed by human activity since 1769 through activities including agriculture, ranching, deforestation, mining, urban sprawl, and, most recently, industrial-sized green energy installations. Salt cedar slash tamarisk and Russian olive slash oleaster are often maligned as invasive plants that should be eradicated. But as I co-wrote with Nicole Patrice Hill in 2019, quote, In the western United States, these two trees are now the third and fourth most frequently occurring woody riparian plants, and the second and fifth most abundant species along rivers. To eradicate them would entail destroying a significant amount of healthy vegetation, with no little amount of collateral damage to other flora, and would incur a hefty cost. End quote. These two species are accused of pushing out native flora, such as cottonwoods and willows, not providing food for native fauna, and of monopolizing water. However, the success of these trees has resulted not from stealing space or moisture from native plants, but of destructive changes to watercourses by industrial development. 
Dams significantly change the flow, temperature, and cycle of rivers. Water tables are drawn down by agricultural irrigation. Tamarisk and Russian olive happen to be better adapted to these harsher circumstances than the native cottonwoods and willows. They have filled gaps that opened, rather than forced their way in. The result is what is called a novel ecosystem. Fifty kinds of birds nest in Tamarisk, including the southwestern willow flycatcher, which is endangered because of habitat loss. At least 44 kinds of birds, as well as various native mammals, eat Russian olives as hardy winter food. Given the prevalence of the introduced trees now, and the dearth of natives, many animals are now dependent on them. Spraying the trees with herbicides has not and will not change the fact that the dams are responsible for the altered landscape, not the trees themselves. At some point, do we recognize that the tamarisk and the Russian olives are de facto native, even if they're not de jure? For what it's worth, all those birds have already cast their vote. Additionally, novel aspects might be temporary after the process of succession advances. Succession is a common ecological process in which the dominant flora of a landscape changes over time due to the ways that landscape is changed by the flora itself. So, after a disturbance, such as a landslide or the building of a road, the first wave of plants, who are sometimes called pioneer species, are often annuals that quickly fill the space. They produce a profusion of flowers that attract pollinators and seeds that feed animals. Such pioneers can be thorny, which is nature's way of saying, keep out while I fix this. A hallmark of the stage is rebuilding fertility in the soil. The annuals might be followed by shrubs, including berry bushes, which attract yet more animals, including birds. The scat left by these animals enriches the soil more. The bushes provide shelter for trees to germinate, and in time, the trees shade out the berries. There are cases where disturbed landscapes that have been invaded by non-native plants have been left untouched, and the exotics have ended up doing nothing more than fulfilling the role of pioneer species, and the area has returned to natives over time. So, when invasives are constantly beaten back in a given location, it's possible that this interference is holding back the natural processes of healing and recovery, that is, succession, and ironically working against the intended goal of bringing back natives. Novel ecosystems can demonstrate nature's inherent resilience. What we need to do is see it. As time goes on, we'll certainly have more opportunities. Climate change. According to National Geographic, half of all species are on the move. This is because, as the climate changes, so do ecosystems. With temperatures rising, species are moving further north or higher in elevation. As time goes on, this means that more and more species will migrate, quote, outside their natural range, thereby becoming non-native or even, to some, invasive. Those that can migrate, that is. Many plants will become, as wild-tending guru Phoenicia Medrano used to say, refugees without legs, unable to flee fast enough and far enough to find safe haven. If that's the case, then we must help them, Phoenicia repeatedly counseled. The biologists call this assisted migration, and it's a topic that's coming up more frequently as time goes on. Some of the strongest arguments against it come from the anti-invasive crowd, who are not, I will stress, in total overlap with the crowd that loves native plants. However, many spaces where native plants are discussed, especially online, have become dominated by anti-invasive rhetoric with other views prohibited. It's sad to see for those of us who just love plants. Why does this matter? The term native can have utility. It tells you that a plant was well adapted to a given place in a given time period, which can be helpful for understanding a species or an ecosystem. But as the basis of an us versus them ideology, it becomes a weapon. Some people say that the proliferation of non-native plants is a manifestation of colonialism. But I would counter that the mindset which insists on declaring them irredeemably bad is far more so. That mindset leads to herbicides and other forms of mass killing that inevitably cause damage to non-target species. That mindset is all about imposing an old and possibly imagined order, rather than appreciating a new succession. That mindset seeks control, not cooperation. We cannot afford to approach the world that way anymore, as if we ever could. If you enjoyed this reading today, please consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L to find out about the other podcasting I do, visit radiofreesunroot.com.
www.thepodcastnetwork.com.